sure we need the microphone, but I'm going to use it for the sake of the recording. <laughs> um, all right, so good evening. My name is Rose Tomasi. On behalf of Crossroads Cultural Center, I would like to welcome you to this evening's event, An Education That Nurtures Freedom, What is the Goal of Schooling? Uh, as a teacher myself and a person with a deep-seated love of learning, I have found uh, myself extremely provoked to ask this question since I began teaching freshman composition classes at City College several years ago. Well, I had come to take for granted that learning was something worth pursuing for its own sake, I came to see, especially when I transitioned to working in a high school two years ago, that this is not a commonly held idea. Now, to be clear, working in a public college and an urban high school has taught me that some of my initial beliefs about education were overly formed by idealism and an impractical disregard for the role that education plays in improving the social circumstances of millions of people. Nonetheless, I came to see over time that these practical concerns um, often come to overwhelm any deeper questions about the nature and purpose of education. So with this in mind, I began to ask again, what should be our goal in educating human beings? We frequently hear about quote-unquote preparation for the future and college and career readiness, but is there an overarching purpose that can offer unity to an educational endeavor? and guide us in our work as we develop curricula, practice pedagogy, and enter into the day-to-day -day life of learning and schooling? In order to consider these questions, I think that we need to understand more deeply what kind of things human beings are. So tonight we have invited Margarita Mooney from Princeton Theological Seminary and Roosevelt Montas from Columbia University to share their thoughts regarding what education looks like when it is conceived of as the context in which the freedom of a human being is drawn out, nurtured, and allowed to develop and flourish. Margarita Mooney is an associate professor of congregational studies at Princeton Theological Seminary and the founder and executive director of Scala Foundation. At Princeton, she teaches classes on philosophy of social science, research methods, religion and resilience, and sociology of religion. She received her BA in psychology from Yale University and her MA and PhD in sociology from Princeton University. Prior to returning to Princeton in 2016, she held faculty positions at the University of North Carolina and Yale University. Her research, which has been funded by more than $3 million in external research grants from the John Templeton Foundation, lies at the intersection of social sciences, moral philosophy, and practical theology. Her first book, Faith Makes Us Live, Surviving and Thriving in the Haitian Diaspora, explores how religious beliefs and practices contribute to the resilience of Haitian immigrants in Miami, Montreal, and Paris. Based on research she did with young adults across the United States, she has written articles on the suffering and resilience of people who have experienced trauma. Her work has been featured in online journals such as Public Discourse, Real Clear Policy, and Church Life Journal. Through Scala Foundation, Professor Mooney organizes reading groups, seminars, and conferences on classical liberal arts education. Mooney's work on the importance of beauty to all fields of education, including engineering, was featured in the online blog of Scientific American. Roosevelt Montas was born in the Dominican Republic and moved to New York as a teenager. He attended public schools in Queens and was admitted to Columbia College in 1991 through its opportunity programs. He graduated from Columbia in 1995 with a major in comparative literature. In 2003, he completed a PhD in English, also at Columbia, where he began teaching in the faculty of the English department in 2004. In 2008, he was appointed Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Director of the Center for the Core Curriculum at Columbia College. After 10 years, he stepped down from his role as director to take on a position as senior lecturer in the Department of English and Comparative Literature in Columbia Center for American Studies. Montas specializes in antebellum American literature and culture, with a particular interest in American national identity. His dissertation, Rethinking America, won Columbia University's 2004 Bancroft Award. In 2000, he received the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching by a graduate student, and in 2008, he received the Dominican Republic's National Youth Prize. Montas speaks and writes on the history, meaning, and the future of liberal education and is writing a book for Princeton University Press about his experiences as a student and teacher. So without further ado, I will welcome Professor Montas to speak first. 
we have decided that that is the order that makes the most sense. Um, so here you go. Thank you. Should I speak to you? Okay. 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 Now that microphone was going in and out. Yeah, don't use it. Don't use it. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. I think I can speak loudly enough. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out on this Friday evening. There are other things that could be done on a Friday evening. Um, thank you, Rose, for your very kind introduction. And it's an honor for me to share this this table with my dear friend Margarita Mooney, um, who is, a, as many of you must already know, a powerhouse and a force of nature. Um, so an education that nurtures freedom, what is the goal of schooling? I want to start by reading a quote from Plato. This is from Plato's Republic. Education isn't what some people declare it to be, namely putting knowledge into souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. But our present discussion, on the other hand, shows that the power to learn is present in everyone's soul and that the instrument with which each learns is like an eye that cannot be turned from darkness to light without turning the whole body. Then education is the craft concerned with doing this very thing, this turning around, and with how the soul can most easily and effectively be made to do it. It isn't the craft of putting sight into the soul. Education takes for granted that sight is there but that it isn't turned the right way or looking where it ought to look and tries to redirect it appropriately. I think that this analogy of um, eyesight is very illuminating. The mind is constituted in such a way that it cannot help but assent to truth. When the mind encounters a truth, it can't resist accepting it. It literally cannot. It's like the eye. If it's open, it cannot help but see. It cannot decide not to see. So the human mind is like an eye looking, and when it encounters truth, it cannot help but see it. That's why Plato speaks here about a turning around, a redirection of capacities that are inherent in the human soul. Something of this insight is captured in the very word we have to describe what we are all here to think about, the word education. It's very useful to understand the history of words. Education comes from the Latin verb educere, which means to draw out or to bring out or to lead out. Education, true education, concerns the tapping of innate capacities that each of us carry inside of us. Plato's teacher, Socrates, had a famous doctrine which declared that all knowledge is recollection. When we learn something, Socrates argued, we are only becoming aware of what we already knew. So that no one can really teach anything in the strict sense. All they can do is turn your intellectual eyesight in the right direction and then you see. In his Divinity School Address, Ralph Waldo Emerson put the same insight this way. Truly speaking, it is not instruction, but provocation that I can receive from another soul. Let me illustrate. Take the simple mathematical proposition, 2 plus 3 equals 5. We all know that. And that knowledge illustrates perfectly two points implied in Plato's analogy of the eye. The first point is that no one actually taught you that 2 plus 3 is, is 5. All somebody did was point it out to you. Once you understand what numbers are and what the operation addition is, then you see that 2 plus 3 equals 5. Your elementary school teacher or your parents didn't teach that to you. They only pointed it out and you saw it. That's the first point. The second point implies in, in, implied in Plato's analogy is that you can't help but see. Nobody can truly deny that 2 plus 3 equals 5. You just can't. You can close your eyes and shake your head and repeat like an incantation, 2 plus 3 is not 5. 
You can be stubborn and insist on it verbally, even swear by it, but you can't believe it. The mind cannot help but assent to truth. So education that nurtures freedom, the title of our, of our panel tonight, takes these insights as axiomatic. It turns your intellectual eyes towards your own innate capacities. It is a practice of self-examination, of looking into yourself under the provocation of various prompts that make what I call a liberal curriculum. Here's a quote from another oldie, Aristotle. It is evident then that there is a certain kind of education that children must be given not because it is useful or necessary, but because it is noble and suitable for a free person. That's from Aristotle's Politics. This notion that there is a kind of education that is given not because it is useful, but because it is suitable and noble for a free person, brings up the issue of freedom. The name that we have for the kind of education that is appropriate for a free person is liberal education. Liberal education is education for freedom. Not for left of center politics, but for a life of freedom. A life that is lived not out of compulsion, coercion, or necessity, but a life that expresses the character of autonomy and freedom that is characteristic of the human state. In the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, Immanuel Kant noted that the science of the laws of nature is called physics, whereas the science of the laws of freedom is called ethics. This is quite intuitive for us. Only those actions that are undertaken freely can express a moral quality. If I am forced or compelled to act ethically, the action lacks any moral worth. You know, if you imagine, you know, you, you're walking down the street and you see, say, uh, a person that's having trouble crossing the street, they have, maybe they have some physical disability or something, or old, for whatever reason, and then somebody who's like, obviously in a rush, stops, helps this person across the street, and then resumes their journey, you would see that and take that to be an action that has a moral quality to it, an ethical value. But if then you learn that that person is actually forced under the threat of punishment to do that because they could, God knows why, they committed some crime and the punishment is that every time they see somebody having trouble crossing the street, they have to stop what they're doing and help them. Then the action, even though it's the same action, loses its moral quality. Because an, a, an action only possesses a moral quality when it expresses our freedom. The moral quality of an action is separate from the action. It is not found in the action, but in the quality of freedom expressed by that action. I find the life story of Frederick Douglass to be one of the most inspiring and illustrative examples of the meaning of education for freedom. I've had this semester the great pleasure of teaching a seminar on Frederick Douglass. It has been just an extraordinary ride. Here's a passage from Frederick Douglass's first autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of an American Slave. Very soon, so Frederick Douglass was uh, born a slave in a, in a plantation in Maryland, and when he was a, a boy of eight or so, he was sent to live in the house of the brother of his legal owner in Baltimore, um, Thomas Ald and his wife, Sophia Ald. So this is Frederick Douglass talking about uh, being eight years old and arriving in Baltimore to be the child companion of a young son of this, of this couple. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Ald, she very kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point of my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, 
that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his own words further, he said, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. And that, that expression, to give an inch, take an L, today we have a similar expression, is you give an inch and take a mile. So an L is like this whole side of a house. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that nigger, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments that lay slumbering and called into existence a new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation, explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty. To wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. Um, an extraordinary passage. Douglas gets this understanding that literacy, education, the world that would be open up, opened up to him would be the pathway from slavery to freedom. And indeed, he takes that pathway. And I encourage you to look at his biography and see how extraordinary a journey it is. That notion and insight of Douglas, that education is the pathway from slavery to freedom, is also an animating insight of our understanding of true education, of liberal education. But today, you might say, there is no more slavery. That, that thing was outlawed. That's not quite true. There is no longer, in the US, chattel slavery, where you are literally owned by someone else 24-7 and for the rest of your life. But there are other forms of slavery all around us, forms of subjugation, coercion, and domination. One of the most perverse, pervasive forms of slavery around us today is what's been called wage slavery. That's when you sell your labor for a period of time and are, during that time, completely subject to someone else's authority. This form of slavery was recognized even in antiquity. In his famous book on duties, Marcus Tullius Cicero says that whoever gives his labor for money sells himself and puts himself in the rank of slaves. It's almost taken for granted today that this is okay, that it's some kind of life to sell yourself to servitude and dehumanization from Monday to Friday in order to buy the privilege of living on the weekends. But it's not so. This is not the worthiest life for a human being. There is little dignity in that, and on the contrary, a degrading brutalization of human freedom. So it's not right that education should just be about preparing to sell some portion of your humanity for wages. Yes, of course, education should give you skills and competencies that should help you make a living. But there is also a higher calling for education. <clears throat> education should also be about how to be free about how to live the life of a free individual, not just the life of a hired laborer. As W.E.B. Du Bois would put it, the true college will ever have one goal, not to earn meat, but to know the end and aim of the meat which life nourishes, of the life which meat nourishes. In the politics, again, Aristotle makes a relevant point. He says, a complete community comes to be for the sake of living, but it remains in existence for the sake of living well. Aristotle's insight here is quite crucial. While survival and sustenance are at bottom the reason why we live together, any well-organized society will overcome the threat of extinction quite quickly. 
once the necessaries of survival are assured, the questions of living shift fundamentally, and we begin to concern ourselves not just with survival, but with existence. How do we live well? What kind of knowledge best guides life? What do we do when most of our physical and mental energy doesn't go to just surviving? Here's Cicero again. The search for truth and its investigation are, above all, peculiar to man. Therefore, when we are free from necessary business and other concerns, we are eager to see and to hear or to learn, considering that the discovery of obscure and wonderful things is necessary for a blessed life. I love that, that the discovery of obscure or wonderful things is necessary for a blessed life. Did you know that the Greek word skole, from which we get the word school, means leisure, having nothing to do? School is not supposed to be about work, but about what you do when you don't have to work. And you know what you do when you don't have to work? You delight in the discovery of obscure or wonderful things. Thank you, Cicero. I'm going to end with another kind of longish quote and I probably won't comment on it but um, it, it, it puts a I think a very bright focus on what the point of education should be. Um, it's a quote from the Buddha, the historical Buddha, it comes from the Pali Canon, the oldest collection of teachings from the Buddha. The Buddha is uh, in this quote talking to one of his uh, supporters, last disciples, a, a local king. So the Buddha says, what do you think, great king? Suppose a man, trustworthy and reliable, were to come to you from the east and on arrival would say, if it please your majesty, you should know that I come from the east. There I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds coming this way crushing all living beings in its path do whatever you think should be done then a second man were to come to you from the west and would say if you please your majesty you should know that I come from the west there I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds coming this way crushing all living things in its path do whatever you think should be done then a third man would come to you from the north and say, if it please your majesty, you should, come that I, you should know that I come from the north. There I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds coming this way, crushing all living beings. Do whatever you think should be done. Then a fourth man will come to you from the south. And on arrival he would say, if it please your majesty, you should know that I come from the south. There I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds coming this way, crushing all living beings. Do whatever you think should be done. If, great king, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human state being so hard to attain, what should be done? The king replies, If, Lord, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human life being so hard to obtain, what else should be done but dhamma conduct, right conduct, skillful deeds, meritorious deeds, and I imagine the Buddha took a small pause here, so imagine that. Then he resumes. I inform you, great king. I announce to you, great king. Aging and death are rolling in on you. When aging and death are rolling in on you, great king, what should be done? You might think this is very depressing. But let me remind you what Montaigne said, you don't die because you're sick, you die because you're alive. You cannot be truly alive except through a vivid apprehension of your death. Thank you. On that cheery thought, I pass it on to Margarita. Well. 
Well, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and talk about this subject of the end of education because although I've spent really most of my entire life either as a student or a teacher, it wasn't really until a few years ago that I began to really look into this question of education. Uh, what is the end of education? And what, what really got me to think hard about this question was when I moved from my first job as a professor at the University of North Carolina, I was there for six years. Then I moved back to my own alma mater of Yale and I really wanted to live in one of the residential colleges with students and thought it would be fun. And it was fun, but I also began to see for the first time what really goes on in student life and there were some real serious problems around mental illness. Um, there were some a lot more heavy drug abuse than when I had been a student at Yale, which made me wonder what was going on. And then beyond that, even the students who weren't necessarily struggling with mental illness or drug abuse were really asking very deep questions about their own personal identity and how that relates to what they were learning. And in part because I wanted to be able to have more of these deep conversations, I, I began to think about this larger question of the end of education. And it was on a seminar organized by an organization called Liberty Fund that I first read Jack Maritan's book, Education at a Crossroads. And what I wanted to do tonight is kind of briefly sketch this journey that I've been on in the last four or five years of reading different philosophers of education and thinking about what this kind of central question about what is a human person, how that influences philosophy of, of education, and then how that flows back into educational culture teacher-student interactions, and just the structure of educational institutions more generally. Um, and so I think what, and by the way, if you don't capture all of what I'm going to say, I will just warn you that a fair amount of what I'm going to say tonight has been published in an article that I brought copies of uh, with me. So if you're not familiar with some of these authors that I'm talking about or some of these quotes seem long, you can find those in some things I've published or go to my website, margaritamooney.com or scalafoundation.org and find some of these articles. But I wanted to start off with, I think, a really uplifting quote from Maritan um, when I first read this. When he, he starts his book on education at the crossroads, really emphasizing that we can't really understand the end of education if we don't ponder the meaning or our understanding of the human person. Um, of course, my version with my notes in it isn't here. So let me find Maritan for a second. Okay, here we go. So for Maritan, his definition of the person is, man is a person who holds himself in his hand by, by his intelligence and his will. He does not merely exist as a physical being. There is in him a richer and nobler existence. He has spirited super existence through knowledge and love. Now, that's a, that's a big sentence, and we could spend time philosophically unpacking the meaning of a lot, a lot of those words, but I'll come back to what I think is significant about that. But then from that understanding of the human person, he says that the true end of education is to guide man in the, in the evolving dynamism through which he shapes himself as a human person. And what Maritain is doing when he says those things, in this, in this book, it's a very short book. I actually recommend everybody read it. I brought a copy if you want to see how short it is, and I can entice you to read it. What he's doing there is actually very sophisticated ways critiquing the dominant paradigms of education that he's seeing as a Frenchman visiting the United States in the 1940s. And those two dominant paradigms are pragmatism and a kind of philosophical Marxism. And what he's arguing is that all these other educations, you know, all these other ends of education, solving problems, even making people into good citizens, he's arguing have to be secondary to the primary end of education which is to actually form this inner world of the human person, right? This, this person made for knowledge and love. And he's really arguing that what, what really matters, all, all that we do in education has to come back to forming the conscience of the person that can perceive and respond to what they're listening or capturing from reality, right? So his, the end of education has to begin and end with the conscience of the person, with the inner life of the, of the person. Now, what I try to do in this article, and what I'm going to try to do briefly tonight, is sketch how, in some other theories of education, it sounds like that's what they're talking about, but 
but if you don't really understand sort of some of the assumptions behind words like dialogue or problem solving, you might think they're actually referring to this inner life of the person as Maritain means it, but they're oftentimes not. And it can become a little tricky. Um, so, for example, one author who I teach a lot in the classes that I've, that I've uh, taught on liberal arts education is Paolo Freire. His book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is one of the best-selling books on education, um, if not the best-selling book. It still is. It's been around since 1968. And I think what people find that resonates with them from Pedagogy of the Oppressed is his emphasis on dialogue and sort of breaking down sort of a, what uh, Freire would call the banking model of education, where students are receptacles and you're depositing, making deposits of information, right? That's, that's not what education should be, right? We can resonate with this idea that education should be this dialogue where you get in touch with your own personal experience and what you bring into the classroom matters, what you're encountering. And so I think people find in Frere these, these words of you know, liberation and um, dialogue, experience, they find it appealing because it seems to be bringing the personal identity of the student into the classroom, which is extremely important. However, I think that there's some shortcomings because really ultimately if you get if you read all the way to the end of Frere, or even if you just read some of the references that he's making, Frere has made a lot of a priori philosophical assumptions that he doesn't attempt to defend, he just kind of refers to. Not, not, nothing necessarily wrong with that. But Frere has already made up his mind about what the end of the human person and the human society is, right? He's trying to do education for the revolution, for the Marxist revolution, right? So he's He's accepted sort of the Marxist class analysis that there's two kinds of people, the oppressed and the oppressors. And the problem with the revolution being fought purely um, on economic grounds is we actually needed a method to educate people about their important role in the revolutionary history, right? So the end of education, the end of forming the person's conscience is actually forming them to a political role towards a given political end. And it sounds a little kind of, you know, he sort of sneaks it in in the end, right? Because the end of this dialogue, the truth as he sees it, is the truth is the necessity for a political revolution to end oppression. So therefore, all of the dialogue that he's talking about ultimately does have to lead to a particular conception of truth. A particular, but it's a particular conception of truth about the direction of history. And it's a particular conception of truth about the direction of history that ultimately doesn't hold to what Maritan understands as the person having a soul in direct, that's capable of directly relating to a supernatural being, God, right? So when Maritan said the person has a super existence of love, he's actually referring to the relationship between the person and the creator. And that, for Maritan, is more important than the relationship between the person and their place in history or their place in a social order. So what Maritain is actually concerned about is that even if we're concerned about the direction of politics or the direction of government, that's not more important than the person coming to know himself as a creature created by God. And that in fact, what Maritain is warning is that concerns about um, uh, political problems, as important as those concerns may be, cannot overtake the formation of the inner conscience of the person because then education can become a tool to actually, and Maritain says this, it's very interesting, he says this later in his book, it's easier to deform character than it is to form it. So Maritain is extremely concerned about education being used to supposedly form character according to the image of the institution, right? He's really focusing on the person having this relationship to the creator of God. Which doesn't mean, as Maritain says, that you don't also educate the person to understand what's going on in the social world or what's going on in politics. It's not that you want them to somehow be ignorant of what's going on in politics or society, but that the individual can never be reduced to an historical social role. And that's an important distinction. It may sound, if you have questions about that, we can come back to that. Um, so and when I've taught Maritain and then Frere, I've also taught, um, so sorry, I'll just say briefly about Dewey and then I'll say something about uh, Jasani. I, I'm not an expert on Dewey, I've only read certain parts of it and I've, I've read some other pragmatists, but I think Maritain's also really critiquing Dewey and having spent some time in Europe this summer, 
Um, I do, whenever I come back to the United States, like I do, I like America because things work, but Americans are really good at solving problems. We're, we're extremely pragmatists. We like to get things done and we want things to work. And there's a lot of good in that. I like that. I like it when things work. And I like, when, I like solving problems. I solve problems all day long. However, the end of the education isn't this kind of pragmatist problem solving. And the quote unquote problem I have with the Dewey approach to problem solving is that it ends up dumbing down the contemplative side of the person, right? Um, and oftentimes people hear problem solving and, or like experiential learning think, well, that's what Dewey means. Well, kind of, yeah, there's nothing wrong with experiential learning or problem solving. But ultimately, pragmatist philosophy has, is trying to collapse anything about the transcendent, the relationship of the person to, to God into the world, into something practical, right? So all we need to know about the super existence of the person is already contained in this experience of the moment or in this thing in the world that I'm fixing. And that's a, that's a subtle but really significant philosophical move, right? And I actually think that that's an underestimated influence on what's causing some of these issues that I mentioned with students. Oftentimes critics of education want to focus on one part of what Maritan's saying, that there's this kind of turn to make education a tool towards one kind of uh, political ideology, and I think certainly some of that goes on, and arguably you could say it could go on on both sides, whatever. I think the thing that we're somewhat less aware of is this dumbing down of the contemplative side of the person that happens in so much education. I will say that having spent time, you know, when my brother and his wife decided to take their kids out of school and homeschool them, I thought they were like, you know, wackos or something, but I've been watching these kids be educated, and it's amazing to me the way that they almost naturally combine structure with play and there's a sense of wonder and a sense of awe that hasn't kind of been beaten out of them and as I'm watching them now go through high school I realize that I think in high school I was somewhat being dumbed down um, you know there was this there was an emphasis on getting a certain type of grade or getting a test score or getting in like the, the goal became to get in to something else after that and the sort of free thinking or ability to kind of really focus on a task and then go pull back and do something else, the environment became so constrained and the curriculum becomes so constrained and the goal becomes very clear and it's expressed in a number. And I think kids feel a lot of pressure around that. And they're losing the kind of playful, childlike creativity and awe that's not just about kind of having fun. I'm not talking about like entertaining students. I have worked at very well-funded institutions that seem to have endless budgets to entertain students. It's astounding to me. And they're getting more unhappy. Something is wrong. And I think what I've learned in running the Scala seminar that I've done now three years in a row, it's really been students' comments and students' feedback that I'm starting to grasp what's going on. Because what the students tell me is that it's the environment that we create together as a group of students, as a teacher in the text, combined with opportunities for play together. Literally, we just go play games or you know, humor. I like humor in the classroom. People call me a wacky professor. I think that's great. Um, but I think that humor, I, I, even, I sometimes even practice it intentionally. And I think it kind of loosens up the brain, right? It loosens up the creativity in the brain. Whereas we've tended to think of as an intelligence in a particular way, and we've almost kind of reduced the human person to a thought-making, you know, supercomputer, and we've forgotten these intrinsic human capacities for creativity and awe and wonder. And when you put students in an environment where, yes, they're encountering difficult texts. I mean, people look at the pictures from my summer program and think we're just playing all day long. And I'm like, no, we actually read like 10 books. Uh, we, we work really hard. We work our brains really hard but we're also really deeply engaged in these shared experiences of beauty and contemplation. And that feeds back into our learning. Um, so I'll just kind of try to wind down quickly here and say that another book that I teach to students, and I kind of want to end on this, I also think every educator and every student should read uh, Luigi Giussani's book, Risk of Education. And what I have found in teaching that with students is that Giussani, I think, and I actually think this is largely what Jasani is doing. He's pulling together kind of a Catholic understanding of the human person with educational method. And what students really pick up on is that 
Jasani's method of education is very much about dialogue and encounter and a lot of the things that Frere is talking about. But my, it was my students who really picked up on this, that there's all of these words in Jasani that you're not going to find in Frere. What are some of those words? Tradition, authority, faith, verification, and this is a really important one that students talk to me about, mystery. And one of my students said this, and I thought it was an incredibly powerful insight, that she actually thought that it was Jasani's firm holding on to the inner life of the person as somehow being mysterious and beautiful and transcendent, what actually makes possible the goods of solidarity and communion and dialogue that Frere wants to get us to. But, she said, what happens to things like community and solidarity and dialogue when the human person has become nothing but the product of a social environment as expressed by their group identity or nothing but an actor in a historical drama leading to a political or economic revolution. That's eradicating the mystery of the human person. And when you do that, I think this is the key that my students have helped me see, when you eradicate that mystery of the human person, you're not going to get the constitutive ends or the intrinsic goods of community and love and friendship and solidarity that they so desire. As I said, if each person can be, if, if the inner life of a person is nothing more than an expression of a social context or a historical dialectic, or if the inner life of the person is exactly the same as what they do in the world, then we're going to end up with a kind of dumbed down pragmatism or a soft totalitarianism that tells everybody to behave in a certain way, to play a certain role, or how to function well at a certain social level. In a, in a certain social responsibility. So I think one of the major problems that I'm trying to understand today in education is to go back to what I was saying before, how to help, how do we help as parents, educators, workers, whatever we are, help young people form a coherent personal identity that's going to help guide them through their education, regardless of what field that is. So many students that I work with really lack a sense of belonging or vocation. And frankly, you know, the most heartwarming thing students have ever said to me is that I've both helped them shape how they think about a particular subject, but that they feel like they can come and simply talk sometimes when they have questions about life that sometimes really don't have answers and require being able to sit with them in the mystery. Like a student who, both, who lost both his, his mother and his father during graduate school. Or my student John, who I talked to in the hospital as he was dying of cancer at 26. And there is no nice, coherent, tight, philosophical, frankly, or theological answer to someone who's going through this kind of suffering. But there is an ability to open your mind and your heart to face some of these ultimate questions um, that is in a way that integrates our human capacity for knowledge and for love, for knowing and for, and for being. So I will, I will end there, but I know Rose has some really great questions, and I think what I hope we get to in the questions is I've given a lot of thought, as you can tell, to sort of the cultural and the personal elements of the crisis of education, but I think what does it mean to take these ideas that we've talked about and have them actually impact the structures of education is not entirely, I'm not entirely clear how to, how to do that, but I do think that we need to both think about shifting educational culture and shifting the way that educational institutions work and not think that, oh, if we just change educational culture, institutions are going to follow, nor vice versa. If we just get the institutions right, then we don't have to worry about educational culture. I think we need serious thinking about both of those two things. Thank you. Okay, so the first question I wanted to ask is more for the sake of going a little bit further in what, especially what Roosevelt was saying. Um, I'm wondering if you could describe briefly what, in a practical sense, sorry, but just for the practical down-to-earth sense, what would a authentic liberal arts approach 
look like uh, in terms of something like curriculum or even like the pedagogical uh, method of a teacher. But I, I, for me, I especially wonder like in terms of the curriculum, what does it actually look like for you, in your opinion? Um, should I go first? Sure. I have a lot of experience with this question, um, practical experience from 10 years as director of the Columbia Core Curriculum uh, at the higher education level. So I, um, some of you here are, are teachers and um, I think understand better pedagogical, developmental, cognitive, uh, social issues at the primary and secondary level than I do, so I um, would refrain from explicitly addressing that form of education, but at, uh, at least at a, at a higher educational level, there are a couple of elements that I think are um, sort of best practices or, or um, aspects of that any liberal education program ought to have centrally. So. One of them is that a liberal education can only be delivered in a kind of artisanal way. You cannot mass produce liberal education. Liberal education, at the center of the project of liberal education is not the subject matter, it's not the skills or the, or, or the knowledge or the information that's being transmitted. At the center of a liberal education project is the student's development. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why liberal education is done supported today, even in higher education, because higher education is dominated by disciplines. And liberal education today is mostly taught as introduction to disciplinary study. Uh, so if you take a literature class that's supposedly part of your liberal education, in fact, you're just being taught like how to be a graduate student in literature. Um, the project of liberal education has the student's development at its center rather than the discipline or the knowledge to be transmitted. Uh, another aspect is that it's got to be conversational. It has to be interactive. The student learns by a process, by an organic process of conversation, exchange, and dialogue with the teacher and with others. Um, so it's got conversation has to be at the center, which also means that it can only be done in small groups. You cannot have a, a liberal liberal education program with very large classes. You have to be able to contain the groups in such a way that there is um, uh, exchange. Um, another thing that, that, that I think is extraordinarily effective, although it's not the only way of doing it, it's the way we do it at Columbia, is that we take what sometimes is called a great books approach. That is, we, um, we have this notion that exposing the students to some of the most significant texts in in the past some of the most provocative some of the texts that have for a long time proven to be particularly illuminating of the fundamental human experience that having students encounter those texts that deal with great questions with persistent enduring um, existential questions of the human condition, that having them encounter that and debate that and read those texts is um, a powerful way to, to deliver a liberal education. Um, one last thing that, that, that we do on the, on the practical end at Columbia is that we emphasize commonality of intellectual experience. That is, Columbia has this very peculiar approach where the whole freshman class is reading the same books at the same time for the entire year. So there's a, there are 1,200 students who come in and whatever, the, the first week of December, they're going to be reading the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of October, they're going to be reading the Oresteia, and somewhere in April, they're going to be reading Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, the whole 1,200 students in small groups, right? Um, and they do the same thing as sophomores. They take another year-long course that follows the common curriculum. That um, has a very, very powerful impact um, in creating community and cre creating dialogue. Um, and in linking students to a broader, a broader, larger project. And also with having faculty move away from just their disciplinary specialty and teach in this, in this common, common project. So those are some kind of practical ingredients that I think um, go into making a powerful, transformative liberal education. They 
I think have their analogs and their adaptations for um, primary and secondary school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add, and this might jump into one of your other questions you sent in advance. I mean, I would just add, I have had a lot of conversations with people running classical schools at the K to 12 level. And in some ways, what should be in the curriculum isn't a very huge debate. I mean, there's the kind of the great books curriculums. I'd say there's kind of one model, which is the great books kind of at a high school right. level. But then there's also the quadrivium and the trivium, the sort of, you know, historic. And so I think that's kind of the core of what goes on in the K-12 to level from a classical liberal arts. And I think what what I think really I find exciting when I actually visit these schools, I visited a number of these independent schools that are popping up doing this, um, it seems to me that some of the commonalities that really seem to work, some kind of emphasis on great texts, because then you get people debating and talking and this kind of interactive. But also, I've, I've in, interestingly, I found a lot of these independent schools are really emphasizing natural science and mathematics as well, but bringing back this kind of sense of awe and creativity and kind of a hands-on. But under teaching, educating students to really encounter the created order is extremely important. And I think great books curriculums won't quite get you that, right? So that's another thing. And the other thing I think that often gets thrown in, um, in many of these schools, not all, but many of these schools doing this are also doing this intentionally with, a, with the goal of Christian formation through prayer and worship and leisure. And so kind of, uh, what I would say is, you know, I'm not advocating we can all somehow go back to the Garden of Eden and we'll all be like in some, you know, kindergarten experience that just goes on and on and on. Like, any of you who've worked in education, it's extremely hard to change things and move these institutions. But there are good models out there, and they might not all work perfectly, but there are these good models. And if you're doing any one of those things, you're doing something really important. If you can pull all of them together, I think you can really blow students' minds. But the other thing, and this is where my thinking is starting to go, is about what does it mean to actually educate the aesthetic dimension of the human person as something related to, but also distinct from formation for proper religious ends, right? What does it mean to actually educate the aesthetic dimension of the person in general? What does it mean to kind of bring out students' creativity and wonder and help students make the connection between the ascent to truth and kind of the experience of beauty and the desire for goodness? Um, aesthetics, for a variety of reasons, kind of almost got taken over by postmodern philosophy, and so there's not been a lot of serious thinking on aesthetics in philosophy or theology, but it's starting to come back. I, so I see kind of this both this high-level rethinking of the aesthetic dimension of the human person that's going on in the scholar level, still kind of small, alongside these really interesting experiments to bring aesthetics back into education, and I think that's a great that's a great dialogue to have. Part of the problem with with what's happening, I think, in higher ed, we were talking about um, before, earlier today, is that when it comes to kind of getting a bunch of faculty, especially in a secular university, to agree that one of the ends of higher education is the formation of a person towards particular ends, I think most faculty kind of recoil at that because it feels like they would be using their conception of what that end is to impose on the students. And most faculty no longer feel as if they're speaking from a coherent tradition that agrees on what the ends of the human person is. So even if you have individual faculty members who might have this vision of formation, they're at the university level, they're very hesitant to, to speak or to act from that place. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I have another, another down-to-earth sort of question. But this one, I, I understand if you, if you feel like it's out of your comfort zone, so please feel free to just not say anything if, it, if you don't want to, but um, this is coming from my own experience as a, as a high school teacher. I'm wondering if you think that there is any way that a truly human education is possible within current institutional structures that most kids end up in, at least in this city, which are like pretty crappy public schools, no offense, I mean, I. It's a good idea, but, um, and then like, uh, you know, and then there's like a bunch of new charter schools that are popping up all, all over the place that have pretty much all the same general model of, you know, strict discipline and passing the state test. So I'm wondering if you think there's any way, like, you know, that it's possible to sort of crack through in those environments. 
Uh, I have to say yes. I have to say that it is possible because otherwise um, we should all just quit and go home. <laughs> and, uh, have a couple of drinks and numb ourselves. Um, I have to say yes. But as I, I, I use this phrase when we were, we were having dinner um, just before everybody had arrived, I think it was just three of us maybe we were, that we were um, talking that I'm a product of the New York City public school system. I went to my local middle school and local high school and you know the one that I was zoned for not without any deliberation or any kind of special program uh, I, I made it out uh, alive and um, merely scarred um, <laughs> but I think that the, the, the New York City public school system and, and large urban systems of public education uh, the phrase that I used was was failure by design um, they just any rational like if you saw them described in a in a in a catalog, like if you're a marshal and you just so like this is what the schooling is, you're gonna say, yeah, that's gonna fail. That's gonna fail most people. That is going to uh, that is that that is not going to as a system be successful. Um, I, I think many teachers work against the system. That is, many teachers succeed in changing lives in. Um, countering the noxious effects of the institutional structures. Um, they, many teachers succeed, succeed at that. I would not have made it where I, to where I have without some teachers that did what Plato said about reorienting you and m making you look in the right direction. Um, so it is possible, but it is possible not because of the system in which the public school system public schooling system, it, it is possible despite that system. I mean, I would just, two things I would say, I think the reason I mentioned earlier, I think the examples Roosevelt is giving is I think that there's incredible ways that people in New York City public schools or other similar public school systems are giving witness to the truths that we're talking about here tonight. To expect that to change you know, the school board of New York City I think is wrong, right? And I think a lot of teachers and people feel that they don't have a lot of power to influence larger structures and they're kind of right. But at the same time, if a movement were to come along to change those structures, you would need the people in place who have the vision to do it. So it's kind of a question of calling. Like, I, I don't want people in a structure that doesn't support their vision of education to feel frustrated and leave. That would be terrible because you are doing amazing things. Um, and believe me, I'm one of those people who often wonders, you know, why can't I do more to affect the institutions? Um, but I would also just counter, I think, from what I see, because, you know, working in these, these elite schools, there are students coming in from the New York public school system into the schools where I've taught, but the vast majority of them are coming from dysfunctional suburban elite schools, to put it bluntly. Um, and so to say that, you know, New York City public schools are in trouble and like, you know, elite schools are not, I think is not correct. I think they might have different kinds of troubles, but the problems of loss of personal identity, the problems of nihilism, you know, drug abuse, mental illness, these are ravaging elite wealthy schools. And just because they're their parents are corporate lawyers and they drive nice cars and live in big houses, I don't think we should not care that education isn't serving them very well either. Thank you. Okay, I have one more question and then open up for everyone. Um, I'm kind of along those lines and this probably ties in quite a bit with Scala, maybe you can say more about Scala in this, but what do you think is the, um, what role does friendship or companionship in your opinion, play for um, for an educator and a student, um, or between students or between educators? Between students, between educators. Either in any in any of the people involved, like do you? Yeah. In what sense can you say? Well, that? I, you know, my, my feeling has always my feeling is and has been for a long time that that education happens by contagion, mm. not by um, transmission. It's not, not not by instruction, but but it's something that kind of you kind of catch, um, and and that happens through an effective channel. Mm -hmm. That is, um, I have some experience teaching high school students, even though my my main 
job is to teach college students. I, for many years, I've taught um, high school students every summer. Um, high school students who are from low-income families and the first in their families who, who hope to go to college. Uh, and one thing that I've seen very evident in that context, but it's also true with college students, is that the first thing that, student, that the student is going to, uh, it's going to matter to the students whether you care about them. That's ground zero. If, you, if, if the student does not get a sense that you care about them as an individual, um, game is over. Um, it is only on that basis, which is a basis of trust, affection, and human connection. Only that is the, the conduit through which education happens, through this um, bond. So that happening between students, that, ha that happening from student to teacher, that happening among teachers, I think is, is a fundamental constituent of education, um, of true education. I'm not talking about instruction and training. I mean, you can get a lot of instruction, a lot of training from watching YouTube videos from just uh, online without any relationship at all. Um, and, that's, and that's not what I'm talking about. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't consider that education. Education is, is, is cultivation into a particular community. Education is drawing out and rearing into a particular community. Uh, and that requires interaction, obviously, there are technologically mediated <coughs> forms of interaction, and those obviously would count towards this, what I'm talking about, community. But um, I guess just to, to summarize what I'm saying, the affective bond, um, the emotional bond, the bond of a human being connecting with another human being first on that level, I think is um, absolutely necessary and absolutely precondition for education to happen. You know, I learned from one of my students, she made a comment that she felt like going on the Scala seminar felt like she, she was the, I think, second or third child in a family of, of eight children. And she said that the Scala seminar felt a lot to her like being in a big family, that you have these long, open-ended debates, lots of different perspectives, and you don't all get along, you don't all agree, and you don't all always like each other, but you somehow stick together. So I think... Just to build on what he said, just to add on to it, because I thought what he said was great, I think friendship is important, but friendship that's understood as kind of commitment to a journey together, not as kind of mutual affirmation friendship or something, um, or someone to go out with on the weekend, right? But like, and I saw, in some ways I think family is almost a better word, because if you come from a big family or you have a family with diverse points of view on everything and people who like to discuss and argue, but you still come back together, right? Because there's a, because there's a commitment to, to the group. And so I think what a lot of students are actually missing is that kind of commitment. And with teachers and students, I have found that um, as a teacher, certainly in higher ed, it's extremely difficult to know the character of your students or what their story is when you only see them in the classroom. And it's really lamentable how few opportunities there are to just informally interact with students that you've gotten to know. So I do host a lot of dinners at my house or try to show up in events or take students places where the conversations just kind of naturally arise and you get to know their character and then you get to get a sense of what's what's drawing them in. Um, I would say with students, I have lots of students who I would call my friends, but there is still a sense of, of authority. And I think to collapse that isn't necessarily the best thing because I think students are actually looking for kind of a authority figure friend. But importantly, if you're educating your children or depending what age group you're working in, I've seen a lot of parents get worried because frankly, you know, when your kids are little, they think you're an authority. And by the time they get to be teenagers or go off to college, their parents are kind of, even if they're great parents and have all the right things to say, their students in teenage years and college years are looking for a moral authority who's not their parent. And it's important for them to encounter those people. And when they don't encounter anybody in their education or the classroom, who they can look up to as a source of moral authority, I think it becomes really problematic um, because then they're not connecting what they're learning in the classroom or who they're learning from to a person who knows how to live a coherent life who can guide them in their life. And students just love coming to the events I organize and getting to hear the story of a faculty member or just realizing that they are a human being who has kids and gets up at five in the morning or you know whatever. And it's just like, oh wow, you know, this person is a person. So. 
that personal relationship isn't about, you know, professors sharing everything with students or giving up their authority. It's about giving them a social context where the authority can actually be embedded in a journey towards a beautiful life. Thank you. Okay, so any other questions? Floor is open. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Mooney, you mentioned that um, this idea of education as, a, as the formation of the, of, of the human person finds it's, it's difficult to find acceptance in university settings because um, um, college faculty be skeptical of sort of anyone trying to impose a conception of the human person or of the education on all of these educations, not, to, uh, not on all of these educators, not to mention the students. I, I'm wondering what, what Professor Montez, you, what do you think about that? Based on your experience at the core, what should we do, or what do you think is the cause of this kind of? Yeah, uh, I think that's a fundamentally true diagnosis. There has the the what accounts for the lack of, or part of what accounts for the lack of a coherent approach to liberal education in colleges is, is the collapse of consensus among faculty on what students should learn. Um, however, a true liberal education does not impose even a view of human nature. What it enjoins us is a shared commitment to its investigation. Um, and, and, and I think the problem that Margarita was pointing to in Ferre is the too facile assumption of we know the answer and we're just going to work our way to the answer. Uh, we're just going to lead the students to the answer. Um, the ultimate subject of inquiry in liberal education is, is the human good. Um, and it would not be the ultimate subject to inquiry if it were not an inherently contestable uh, notion. And it is precisely engaging in that inquiry that constitutes liberal education. Not answering the question of what is the ultimate human good, but asking the question of what is the ultimate human good. Um, so we don't need, it is a red herring to say that we shouldn't do it because we can't agree on what the ultimate answer is. Mm. Just to add that briefly, I think that there's also a difference between agreeing that the question is important and that there is an answer and we need to debate it versus the kind of critical theory skepticism yeah. Yeah. that the question is ultimately unanswerable. Which is ultimately nihilism. Right. That's, yeah. and I think some faculty are in each of the two camps. Some faculty are nihilists. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, who else has a question? Um, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, really, really interesting content here. Um, one of the, the themes was around the, the student-teacher um, relationship and that being an important contributor to like a well-rounded dialogue in education. Um, with technology today, social media, cell phones, the lines are blurring and it's creating a lot of noise. An example is at a parochial school, the wrestling coach um, shared his you know, admiration and, and love expressed in just, you know, I, I love you as a an at student athlete, a contributor to this community and team, and uh, it was used against him um, by that, that that athlete when he transferred out, and that it was used what uh, used against, against the, the, uh -huh. the teacher in terms right. of it made the student uncomfortable. Two years later, when he decided to leave the school, mm -hmm. um, so I'm just you know that it created a big commotion in the community in terms of that student teacher relationship and what are the where are the lines? What is the appropriate dialogue? Um, and, and this is a very popular teacher. Um, it was a very isolated case, but it went to courts. It was front page papers. And so, yeah, you know, it, a lot of people were confused by that instance and what to make of it. I don't know, Kenny. I feel like, I mean, again, having lived in the, in the student norms at Yale and working with people in student life, the fear of litigation that hangs over universities and I guess also schools and we, we live in a litigious society the fact that this teacher made this student uncomfortable if it, whether we think that's a good thing or not a good thing why does that have to become a court case I mean what are we doing 
But when I talk to people about this vision of education, I often get precisely this pushback. I could be accused of inappropriate behavior mm -hmm. if I have any kind of personal relationship with a student outside of class. And people are fearful of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a common sense about what's wrong to do. But then the idea that we should just retract and create a kind of hard shell around ourselves is just Wrong. Yeah. And you know, another aspect of, of this same phenomenon is what is commonly called cancel culture. Um, you know, in, in the quote from Frederick Douglass, I read, I, I, I articulate, I pronounced the N word. Um, because I'm reading Douglass, who uses the N word, and the person who uses the N word in the Douglass quote is a slave holder, his, his, his master. Uh, but there are certain contexts in which um, I would get in trouble by just reading that quote from Frederick Douglass. Um, it, it, it's a it's a minefield, and I know many people who are a concerned about the chilling impact this has had on intellectual culture, and people who have um, stopped teaching certain courses um, or change the way that they teach as a way to protect themselves. Um, I think that that's a mistake to do that. I think that, um, and again I speak particularly with a, with a view to higher education, where it seems to me that part of the educational mission that we as faculty have is to navigate and teach the students, largely by example, how to navigate those waters. And that is an inherently risky, intellectually risky, and it requires intellectual courage, and it requires courage of convictions. It requires us of living a certain type of way. Um, that is a certain type of way that, that you are uh, not impeachable in certain ways because of just the testimony of your life, the way that you live your life. Um, so, but I, I think that we need to, as faculty members, be committed to a robust intellectual defense of freedom of expression, of inquiry, um, and use the controversies as moments to work through educational issues. That is, we need to educate our students, including in those things. Um, and withdrawing and retreating and muzzling ourselves is not the way to do it. It's a, it's, it's a kind of an application of our job. So I work at a public charter school that is classically inspired, and recently we've this, the administration has tried to shift some of the tradition or like this like heavy lifting onto the teachers to read more like great texts or. Um, things like like we read um, like a very very watered down version of the cave allegory from the Republic to talk about like what truth could be, and we had like a staff Socratic seminar and it was and something that I've noticed since my third year working at this school is that the teachers themselves are don't have a sense of personal identity um, themselves as adults and they're educating children who are one like you know maybe perhaps socially vulnerable and economically vulnerable but also like on the epoch of this other, like gen I don't know, generation X, Y, Z, whatever the next wave is. <laughs> well, like, I, I really thought about it, and I, my children had, like, were born the year the iPhone 6 was made. So mm -hmm. that's just like a lot of context for like the, inter the way they interact with reality now. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any experience like working with teachers who, I don't think they're. I, I don't think they're nihilists. Like they're definitely searching, but they don't have. They don't. They themselves don't have the tools to, um, like, find that inner life in themselves. Or like, for example, like a, a comment that a teacher made in the seminar was, we got to this point where she was like, well, you know, whatever your grandma says, like you don't really believe that truth anymore. Like it, it changes every every generation. She was, she was saying that, and we like kind of arrived at this impasse of the staff and this like staff democratic seminar. Like, well, if true changes every generation, like, what are we supposed to do with our children? Um, so I, I'm not sure if the <laughs> it didn't actually like the seminar was supposed to inspire staff to like, you know, find grasping onto this 
onto the truth, but because they themselves lack that compass, like it actually, I think, made them despair a little bit because they themselves were unsure about. Um, so sorry, that was kind of long, but I just wanted thoughts on that. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this, but let me prompt prime you in this way. Um, the activity that we are engaged in of educating our students liberally or liberal education, and I know that that term liberal education sometimes has a specific meaning, but allow me to use it to describe the kind of education that we're talking about tonight. Um, is a countercultural practice. That is, we are engaged in offering a challenge to the prevailing cultural ethos in which we live. And what you get in our students, in our faculty, in our peers, in the faculty, in the in the in the, in the say, faculty culture, both at the higher education and at the primary and secondary level, is a reflection of the contemporary ethos of uh, materialist, consumerist, almost nihilist in the, in, in the uh, kind of epistemological crisis of confidence in which we live, kind of the postmodern condition. That is the cultural tone against which we operate. Um, Socrates, who in, in some ways I think is the paradigmatic figure in this project, was executed by his uh, city, was um, condemned to death by his peers for engaging in precisely an activity that was countercultural, um, that challenged. So um, I do think that we are, we, 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 the forces that we are combating, we're swimming against a, a very strong stream and there's a way this may just be like a constitutional, personal thing, but that's just where I want to be. I, just, I want to be swimming against a stream that's, that's kind of my job. Um, that's why I went into this. So um, I guess all I'm saying is that what, what you are describing, I think, is the stream that we swim against, and, and that's, that's what we're here to do. Yeah. I mean, I think... Sadly, there's a lot of burnout amongst anyone who works in the so-called helping professions, social work, teaching, nursing, etc. And I think for teachers, and specifically whether it's high school or higher ed, um, at least I know for me, when I sort of recognized this need for coherent personal identity, I had something to turn to, which was my own Catholic faith and my own Catholic community, and that was the community that sustained me and supported me in graduate school, all the while wanting to bring my coherent personal identity or faith back into the dialogue I was having with people from Jewish background or Hindu or Christian, right? Not separating from the larger body of the school I was in. But I wasn't going to find the coherent personal identity I was seeking in a sociology graduate seminar or in a sociology PhD. Um, but I had somewhere to turn. And then I think kind of my journey has been to see that more and more younger generations, whether you're, you know, Buddhist or Hindu or what, you know, whatever, Christian, they want to know kind of how you've reached this kind of sense of having a coherent personal identity. And I think where secular universities are a little bit at a crossroads is that it's like, well, you know, the idea was sort of the Rawlsian, you know, veil of ignorance. Like, that's just not something we talk about publicly. We don't talk about our ultimate commitments because simply talking about them is imposing them. And I've seen a shift in the younger generation that wants people to authentically answer these questions about life from a variety of perspectives, certainly, and open to debate and dialogue, but they want people who can speak to them. Um, and so that has been interesting for me. So I would just say practically, if you're in an environment where people around you may not have a coherent personal identity, you can bring yours to the environment you're in and you will have an influence. But believe me, I've tried. You're not going to change other people by telling them that they need to change and go become a coherent person. I tried it probably yesterday or the day before or whatever. It doesn't usually work. I still keep trying. But more importantly, being a coherent person in an environment that feels incoherent 
those people might open up and they might have yeah. questions and you might get to know them and they might start seeking. Or you might realize, you know, I think I'm so coherent and I still like get mad after a faculty meeting and do something I, that's not coherent with who I am and I need to learn from somebody else, you know. So I would, essentially what I'm saying is seek that coherent identity. What I do see in higher ed that has changed since I was a student, there is a proliferation of student interest in religious life of all kinds. And it's a proliferation of these groups. Again, evangelical, Buddhist, Hindu, you know, meditation, yoga, Christianity, all this stuff, they're popping up everywhere. And so what I almost fear in higher education is that students' kind of formation about their identity is apart from what they're learning in the classroom, not integrated into it. And this is the strange situation that I think a lot of secular universities are in. And it kind of almost reinforces this fragmentation that our spiritual seeking or our contemplative nature is over here. And what we need to learn in education is fits into this box that can be tested and measured and gets me to Wall Street or something. <laughs> okay, so I would keep going on for the whole night, but I feel like we should enjoy our wonderful, um, our wonderful reception um, together. And if you have more questions, you can discuss them individually with Professor Mooney and Professor Montas. Um, so I'm just gonna, dot com. Yes, also on our website. <laughs> no, but you really can can talk to them here. At, well, we have a delicious little some delicious treats over in the other side of the hall. So um, just to finish up, um, tonight's event concludes our fall 2019 program. We invite all of you, so many that are here, to our. Um, uh, to the New York Encounter, the annual three-day public cultural event that Crossroads helps to organize and which will take place at the Metropolitan Pavilion in Manhattan um, on February 14th to 16th, 2020. Uh, the 2020 Encounter is entitled Crossing the Divide and it will explore ways in which we can break out from the suffocating ideological schemes that dominate our culture, uh, brought up by Amelia, and rediscover reality as the foundation to reconnect with ourselves, with people near us, and with our larger community. Topics such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the 2020 presidential elections, artificial intelligence, racism, a new vision of our economy, and the renewed relevance of family, and many others will be addressed over the weekend by renowned national and international speakers. If you want to know more about it, check out the website, www.newyorkencounter.org. Um, and uh, when you do leave after enjoying the reception, um, please remember that all our events are free of charge. So in order to defray the expenses of tonight's event, we invite you to consider a donation which you can place at the box which you will find at the exit. So thank you so much to Margarita and Roosevelt for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. And yes, please enjoy the reception. Can we give them a round of applause. Thank you.